Good morning. I'm Donna Chaco. I'm here with Serenity and Health, and we're continuing with this series of pop-up conversations, which I hope you have enjoyed as much as I have. It's been a lot of fun. And I'm thrilled today to have a special guest, and her name is Dr. Amarillis Sanchez. Good morning. Welcome. How are you, Donna? It's great to be here, Dr. Chaco. You know, your volume is a little low. Do you have any way to make it go higher? Um, I can certainly speak higher and I can also... Okay. I don't want to miss anything, you know. <laughs> well, this lady is quite a lady. Um, she graduated medical school 20 years after me, but she's been very busy during these years. And currently, she's a author, blogger, coach, speaker, but she, uh, she started out accumulating honors right from the time of medical school at uh, what was it, Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine, and then studying family practice in Florida, where she received multiple honors uh, in AMA award, and she was president of the uh, uh, Florida Family Practice Residency Association. So she's always been active in the forefront taking leadership roles in her profession. And in more recent years, it has evolved into um, leadership roles in her profession, but linking that more directly with her faith as well. And that's how Amaryllis and I connected. Um, we were just trying to remember when we met, it was like several years ago, a random meeting at a an event at Georgetown for social media getting getting educated educating physicians how to work with the media right mm -hmm. and media training shared, it was fantastic yeah. it was great we share a mutual friend and so that's how we linked up and I'm, I'm really honored that she agreed to um, be here with us today so Amaryllis how in the world did you go from there to here? Because now your plate is so full of all these things. And I know you're going to talk to us a lot. And we all want to hear about your latest book. It's, it's been a few years now, right? You're yeah. Yeah. Recapturing Joy in Medicine. I published that one in 2019. 2019. Uh, right. So and, I have it here on my Kindle. Yeah. It's an, um, lovely. So it's about burnout, uh, prevention, for physicians, but I'll let you tell us your journey, how you ended up, what you're doing now. I'm sure. Sure. I mean, I think it, it really, if I could summarize it in one word, it probably would be service. You know, everything has had to do with something um, which I felt led to do. And then that led to an open door, which led to an open door. And so that's really become my, my life. And I hope my sound is better now. Is it better yes. now? Yes. It is. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so, but it really, in some ways starts when, um, when my, I have, we have three children. I'm married to a pastor now uh, who used to be a pilot. And um, when I was in residency, uh, he was diagnosed uh, with an inflammatory condition that really never went into remission. And that began a very difficult time. So I finished residency having really excelled and had superb training. I just absolutely loved my training program in Florida. Um, and then I went into the Air Force, the most stressful job I've ever had. Um, it really, it really challenged me. You know, and you were in Air Force, interesting. I was. I was an Air Force physician uh, uh, immediately out of residency training, and so my first three years. But in that time, with my husband not uh, doing well physically, and me as a well-trained physician, really unable to help him, right? And then we have a small child, and I'm very stressed at work. And um, one day I went out for a walk. And uh, just feeling really like I needed something to change. And uh, I just felt so much weight, uh, so burdened. And so I went on a walk. And for the first time in years, I, I said this heartfelt prayer as I got back to my house, knelt on the driveway. And I prayed. I said, Lord, if you are real, please reveal yourself to me because I don't know what's going to be of me if you don't. Um, it was like that. It was raw. It was heartfelt. And nothing happened that I could tell at the moment. There were no angels. There were no flashes, um, nothing significant. But in my heart, I believe a journey began. And I'm one of those people who can go back to that one day and that one prayer 
where my life began to change. And then really that's where it begins, I believe. Um, I went to a retreat that really was transforming. Um, it's called Cursillo. And from I then on... That. I went on a Cursillo. Well, yeah. I, for me, it was absolutely life-changing. It, it was, it was uh, at a very pivotal time in my life after my first husband died. And anyway, it was, yes, interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Did, did you carry on with the post Curcio groups that met all the time? Because I got to do that for four or five years. It was just fabulous. It made all the difference. I learned what a, a Christian community is really about. I learned yes. the power of prayer, the power of fellowship, the power of being in the word, uh, the power of community. Uh, really incredible. And so then my husband went and then he felt called to ministry. And that's when I begin to, you know, my, my work as a physician began to merge beautifully with my faith when I went on my uh, second medical mission, which happened to be to Guatemala. And at that time, for the first time ever, I prayed with a patient. And, um, and again, it changed my entire career. That one time when I was trying to help a woman in another country, feeling very much like I, I am not equipped to meet the needs that you are you are telling me you have. And so I felt like God was saying, pray for her, offer to pray with her. And I thought, what? <laughs> uh, I don't know what that looks like. And I did. I, I simply told her when we, she was done sharing with me, I said, listen, I, I thank you for sharing your story. Um, I would love to help you with uh, all those things. But I, you know, I find that although I cannot, I do know the one who can. Uh, may I pray with you? And she was thrilled. She rose from her chair. She held my hands and I prayed for her a very simple prayer. That was not something I really even knew how to do. And then she prayed for me. It was this moment where we connected as human beings, as sisters. And, um, and again, it, it changed the trajectory of my entire career. When I came home, I got on the, on the plane. I remember praying, Lord, from now on, I am not leaving outside of my exam room, the most precious gift I have. Um, which is, you know, knowing you and, um, and the blessings that come when we give ourselves to you. So, um, and that's what happened over 20 years uh, in medicine, uh, very cautiously, with respect always, never, you know, um, never forcing anything, uh, having a relationship, being genuine, authentic, and simply sharing what's happening in my heart and what God is doing. And, um, and it's been tremendous. Oh, that's, well, you listen, you know. You you listened. Yeah. Great steps. I'm sure that wasn't easy in the beginning. It's kind of scary to step out of the, you know, medicine is very. But what I found. Very uh, in its traditions and systems and, you know, it takes and you, courage. And you have to be excellent. I mean, you know, we, we need to be medically excellent, competent, um, and, and continue to do the right thing for every patient, uh, medically, surgically, in every way. But, but people are mind, body, soul, spirit. And so if we are leaving out the spiritual, emotional component, psychosocial issues that are a part of who we are, um, we have done them a great disservice. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't agree, believe, I couldn't agree more. That's one of the things in, in my own life and in, in observing, especially when I worked in the inner city to, to realize that, you know, the suffering in life is vastly vastly more than a diagnosis for which you give a pill is you know it's all the relationship stuff and the stress and so many things that uh, causes misery well and I find that you know again for me it just flowed very naturally from what was happening in my own life and so uh, which is important to again you you have to have boundaries and you know it's never about me it's about each person what they need and right. what they're ready for and what, you know, and what, uh, what God is doing in their lives. And so um, I only remember in the 20 some years that I have, you know, sometimes offered to pray with patients. I only remember two uh, that, um, that said, no, that's okay. Thank you. Um, the one of them um, came back actually about three months later and actually asked me, <laughs> to yeah. pray with him yeah. after after the first time he was a little hesitant it was beautiful and so again i mean i think this is something that if it doesn't it's not flowing from your heart and right. you're not very well trained and cautious in how these things are done uh, providing spiritual care while um, caring for people's physical and other needs um, it, it has to be done right right, right. 
Well, Emerald, tell us about the burnout book. How, how did you come to write that? And, and as you talk about it, um, if there are applications for non-healthcare providers, you know, because it's just, it's a lot about stress and dealing with it. And yeah. I know it applies to your lessons and your teachings apply uh, probably, I suspect, more broadly than just healthcare providers. Absolutely. I've had um, veterinarians, attorneys, uh, teachers, and other professionals tell me this book applies to my profession. And it truly does because it is about recapturing joy. In this case, I wrote it for physicians, so in medicine, but it's really about recapturing joy in life um, and, um, and just finding ways to connect with meaning, with the things that give life purpose. And, um, and so that that's, applies to all of us. It's been pretty cool. I've spoken at law schools uh, since I published the book. I've spoken, I've been invited to speak at college campuses. Uh, so it's been interesting um, that it does. I've heard from different professionals. But how I came to write this book, and um, it covers burnout, but it's really about leadership. It's about advocacy. It's about boundaries. It's about some of the things we bring to our professions that actually become obstacles for us if we're not cautious, because we all have blind spots. And so there, we all have things that, that we are not identifying that are really um, becoming obstacles for us. So it's about a lot of things, emotional intelligence, communication skills, all these things are covered there. But it began for me uh, about seven years into my practice. So this is a long time ago. And uh, when burnout wasn't even talked about. Um, and so I started going through it. And I always say my husband's call to ministry saved my career because right about when I began to feel burned out in a practice that I loved with patients I loved and colleagues I loved, um, I was burning out. I was burning out because of all the things uh, that go with our job where we've lost autonomy, where it becomes, you know, the electronic health record, um, things that really form a wall between us and our patient. And, you know, studies show that um, as recent as a year and a half ago, uh, the study from the Physicians Foundation found that 78.7% .7 of physicians still say uh, the most meaningful part of their profession is the patient-physician relationship. And so anything that stands in the way between that and, you know, our patient and us, it's going to uh, lead us uh, into burnout. Um, and so we need to find antidotes. But what, I, what happened to me is when my husband felt called to ministry, we moved to a different state. And during that time, I was going to work full time. I, had, I was getting my license. And what happened was around the move, I found out I was pregnant with my third child, who's now a teenager. And when I got there, um, I ended up in the ER two days later uh, with some bleeding. And so um, everything went fine, thank goodness. Uh, the pregnancy went along with no issues. But it was kind of a wake-up call. And it was the first time in my career that I stepped off the treadmill of what had become my professional life. And the first time in my entire adult life when I began to just take care of me, be human first, and then a physician, right? Be a mother, be a wife, uh, be a friend, be a sister, be a neighbor. And, uh, and I actually stepped off that treadmill and I took a break from medicine and it, um, I, I always say that it's, it's, it felt almost like being rehumanized, you know, we, we are on this treadmill and just go, go, go. And so from that process and from coaching that I went through, and this is how then I, I end up becoming also a coach for physicians, again, it was transforming in my life and I reprioritized. And when I returned to medicine, I was a different person with different boundaries, different priorities, different goals, and uh, it's made all the difference. Oh, that's fabulous. You know, are there like uh, a few key points this, just from the book? Like if, if you were to, like I wish, where were you when I needed you <laughs> a few years ago when I basically retired earlier than I might have because of a, a roaring, oops, that's not the book cover, because of, a, anyway, because of a yeah. burnout. So, right. so if for people out there who are totally stressed and maybe they're burned out with, who knows, childcare, Zoom, uh, working at home, what, what, are, what, what do you think the book might have for them or that well, you offer them? One of the things that it is, it's, it's truly a coaching manual. So, so what I did is I, um, it's very practical. 
it has exercises that um, it has 50 sections, uh, which means about 50 exercises for people to bring home the points that are made. Mm -hmm. uh, it's written in very short by bite-sized uh, segments so that you don't have to read it from beginning to end in one day, but you can take whatever sections uh, you are needing more. So if it has to do with leadership or self-care or burnout or, um, you know, different needs, you can find it and then read that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very practical. But, um, but the way that it helps all of us is, is that it, it goes to, you know, really aligning who you are with what you do. I think a lot of people are very misaligned when it comes to what they're doing for, you know, most of their week and find that, you know, uh, again, there's a sort of a loss of meaning and purpose. And so as you are intentional in reconnecting with those things that are life giving to you, uh, with your purpose, with what you see as sort of your calling, uh, vocation, um, the more aligned these things become, it, things just like start falling into place and, it, uh, you know, you know, you regain some joy. And, uh, and for us in medicine, I think it's important to regain a, autonomy um, because, again, most of us went to medicine to serve and to help people. And we find that, you know, we spend so much of our days with a computer screen, right? So we're very detached from what brought us to medicine in the first place. So the more we find those places of connection, both with our goals and who we are and our values and with people, the better we do. And so the book, uh, those are some of the things that are covered. Yeah, there. I, I wrote that down that you said in the book um, that you have to know your values, know your limits and know your goals. So, I mean, the, the right. process, one can't just decide to say, I'm not going to go be burned out anymore. You, uh, as you book, as you say, you have to work at it and even spend time thinking and writing down um, yeah. your solutions and yeah, recovery and prevention of burnout um, has a lot to do with self awareness. And so, as you begin to gain or regain self awareness about who you are, what's happening in your current life, and where you want to go, where where you wish you were now, and where you want to go. Then as you begin with the end in mind like that, and then you take smaller steps and consider, okay, what would I need to be doing now if I want to be here in five years? Yeah. And then you become intentional. And often it's very helpful to have somebody who walks alongside you in that process to keep you yeah. accountable, to help you see those blind spots that you may not recognize otherwise, and to sort of be, um, be there with you. Right. Yeah. Are there nuggets from the book that might apply to those uh, feeling a lot of pain and stress during this pandemic, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I think in times of stress, anxiety, and, and certainly during the pandemic, um, I think it's really essential to begin with the basics, to step back. And so, you know, first of all, lowering our expectations of what we are able to do, uh, I think, uh, can help. Um, it, there's this COVID fatigue setting in, right? We're exhausted. Um, and, you know, there's good days and bad days for all of us. And I think, again, self-awareness and, and self-care becomes that much more important um, to, to realize that, you know, you need to ask for help if you need it. Um, sometimes it's from your family members or your coworkers. Sometimes it's from a professional. Um, you know, this is a good time to have somebody who's, who's with you. Uh, it's not a good time to be trying to get through things alone. But I think also going back to the basics as it relates to proper sleep, nutrition, exercise. I think if we did that and then remembering again that we're mind, body, soul, spirit. And so we have to look at all those areas and consider, you know, are we thriving in, in you know, how are we doing, right? And um, how are our relationships, you know, how are um, are ju just all those different areas and not neglect the things that are most important during this time, I think is very, very helpful. Yeah, that is good. That is good. Um, Mark Shields on the news hour was asked uh, his personal take, how he's doing with all of this. And he said, I just keep thinking over and over again of the serenity prayer. And I just have to hang on to that during this time. Yeah. You know, God grant me the serenity yeah. to accept what I, Cannot change the courage to change what I can and the wisdom to know the oh, difference. difference. Yeah. We do need a lot of that now, don't we? <laughs> we do, you know, and I think we need to also, you know, stay close to people who are positive, who are optimistic and who give us hope. And I think uh, it really helps to turn off the news. I mean, I think the less that we're see watching, the better uh, and reading and, um, 
And I find that I have really kind of, I'm recoiling a little bit from social media because there's so much negativity and you have to be careful. I think it's important to share facts, right? I mean, even about masks and things that are very basic, um, that there's so much misinformation. So it's important to share facts, but, but with hope. And I, I know that's been my challenge from the beginning is to, as a physician, I have felt a responsibility to educate my community. Um, but, but with hope, right? Uh, this, this will pass. Um, and actually there's been many blessings that have been a part of the pandemic. You know, I hear of many families uh, that are spending more time together. Um, people, I mean, I know I got, um, you know, on, on a better diet and, uh, you know, have lost some weight that I've been wanting to lose. And that's been great. Um, you know, people who are exercising more, when I walk outside, I see neighbors that I didn't even know lived on my street. Yeah. Uh, that are now outside, you know, so, you know, there's people who are driving less. And so that means they have just kind of more rest and, you know, rest allows that opportunity to, you know, connect with our spirit better uh, than maybe we right. do normally. And, and, you know, for me, silence and solitude are ways where I hear from God and I, and I really rest inwardly, which is so needed. So, Absolutely. so there's many good things that can come from it too. Yeah. We have to remember that and yeah. take advantage of those things, turn, turn off the news yeah. and TV. Yeah. Um, ha- have you been surprised by anything in all of this uh, about your own experience or what you've observed with uh, patients or clients? Um, in, the, in the transition that I've had? Yeah, in your, in your very career. You know, I think uh, probably the biggest surprise has been uh, that the more that I allow myself to become fully who I am as a physician, as a human being, um, you know, as a person of faith, you know, the more I allow myself to, to be fully who I am, the more joy I have. And it's funny because there's fear in that process. You know, there's fear that if you are, if you do this, then this will happen, you know, or people will judge you or people will stop respecting you uh, or whatever it is. And the reality is that um, as in life, most of what we worry about never happens. And uh, those things that are fears or anxieties that uh, stem from maybe our prior experiences or whatever, um, often are simply obstacles. And when you're able to leave that behind and just figure, you know what, this is who I am. Like, why am I trying to pretend or why am I not allowing myself to really be um, fully authentically the person I was created to be? Um, For me, it's been liberating. I mean, I, you know, for me to write is what began it all. Uh, So once I, I went through coaching, I went through, I was burned out. I stepped off the treadmill. Um, I was able to begin to name the things that, uh, were making me feel the way I felt so out of control and so sort of like inauthentic, right? Um, I went through, I, I actually saw a psychologist three times. Her biggest contribution was to get me writing again because I've been a writer since I was three. And so um, the moment I began to write, that's how I process life. I went through coaching. That helped me actually get writing on the schedule. I decreased uh, my patient care hours so that I could flow into this calling really for Uh me writing is a calling then um, from that came my first book which was in 2012 that was walking with Jesus in healthcare and that's when I began to be invited to speak um, at various places and now I speak really throughout the country in medical conferences and um, and you know state medical associations have invited me and different groups and also I lead retreats based on another little book I wrote, The Three Wise of Faith. And so, so my life completely changed. But again, every step of the way, I believe I become more of who I was created to be. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. And that's that means beautiful. I have more joy. I have a greater sense of meaning and purpose in what I do. And so that's my message because I'm living it out. So that's a wonderful message. Yeah. You know, there's something I meant to ask you, so I'm backtracking a little bit. So I hope I don't get, get us all confused. But <laughs> in your book you had a meaningful little um, discussion of rumination. Uh, yes. And, and it really hit home. So maybe you could, that, that's kind of a more medical term, I guess. I don't know. Could you just say what that is? And, and, and I, let me just say that the reason I'm interested in this is because this was a huge part of what went on with me when I was going through burnout. I just couldn't let go of my 
um, distress and anger at the clinic for putting for them putting me in that position. That's how you know you look at things. Yeah, going through that. So could you comment on that? Because I think that's sure. just something for us, everybody, to recognize that we do it. It's so unhealthy, and how to not do it. Yeah, wonderful. And so that obviously is a tendency for anyone uh, that can happen where you fret uh, or you worry or you just cannot let go of something. It's like a record is playing or <laughs> this, I'm dating myself, yeah. like a record or a tape uh, or a CD is playing over and over in your mind and you just cannot hit that pause or stop button, right? And it's not good. It's, it's a recording that's not positive. It is driving you down. It is magnifying things that are negative that may or may not even be true. And so, and so you ruminate or you just kind of dwell on something that is unhealthy for you emotionally and, and probably lies that are being repeated and, uh, or just something you cannot let go of, right? That is, that is keeping you in a bad place. And so, so your mind and your thoughts are so critical in that process because from our thoughts come our emotions and what we do, how we behave or not. And so it's critically important to deal with our thoughts. And so cognitive behavioral therapy is so helpful in that regard. And one of the concepts there is to, you know, again, one of the, I think I mentioned in the book in Recapturing Joy in Medicine is that concept that, you know, it, it's, a, it's something a, a therapist uh, shared with me once. Um, it's like getting on a bus, right? And you can sit next to the very first person you see and you can engage them in conversation and let them engage you. Uh, or you can keep walking and choose to sit alone just with your thoughts. Or you can walk to the next person and choose not to engage. You're sitting next to them, but you're choosing not to engage. And, and it's always our choice, right? And it's the same thing with our thoughts. We can have thoughts that come through and we choose to push the stop or the pause button and say, no, that's not what I'm engaging with, right? Or we can see it and we can see that thought come to our mind and gently decide to walk on by like we chose not to sit next to someone mm -hmm. on the bus, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's always our choice, but if we choose to sit next to them and then begin and engage in this conversation back and forth, um, if it's not a positive conversation, you are driving yourself down and you're contributing. So we have power over it. I loved uh, one, of the, one of the quotes in the book is, we have more power than we exercise. And that includes, so that's a, that's a word to physicians in 2020, um, but it's a word to all of us that we actually have control over our thoughts too. And we can choose to engage or not. And uh, it's, it's a powerful thing when we learn to do that consistently. It, it, absolutely. It, it I mean, it requires self-awareness, as you said before. It requires a mindfulness when, I mean, I think, I don't think I could stop it ever uh, except through prayer. And eventually, um, if, I, if I find myself falling into that, I have a, a prayer practice and it's not mine alone. Many people have this kind of a prayer practice like the Jesus prayer, something, mm -hmm. a, a, yeah. a short prayer you, you just have, and it pops in your head anytime you need it or you call it and it just, it's like walking by. You say, yeah. my Lord, oh my God, I'm going to walk by that thought. And it, yeah. it for me, it, it's just been transformative. Absolutely. And, uh, but I didn't have it at the time. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> the later development. And isn't it great? I mean, I feel like, you know, so many times we try to get through difficult times alone and I'm like, please don't. I have a friend right now that I'm just trying yeah. so hard to... Just get this person to say, I actually need help. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then go, go find right. it, you know. Right. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, there's a, there's a psychiatry hotline now of volunteer psychiatrists um, who are helping physicians uh, throughout the pandemic. And it's a free service to them. And so I'm always sharing. Uh, it's, a, oh, it's an 800 number. Give us that number for the show notes and we'll include that with the, we're going Absolutely. to have it available for everyone uh, yeah. and this is, uh, yeah. books and links to that and other relevant pieces of information about this topic because especially now um, for, for everyone uh, life is um, a bit more difficult yeah, this is getting this is getting a little old <laughs> yeah yeah. So, yeah yeah so we do need we all need a little bit more yeah. than normal right and mm -hmm. also it's a time for patience it's a time for extending grace to ourselves and others 
it's a time for patience and for endurance and you know for for us as people of faith i mean we we can certainly hold on to that and right. we can really grow during times like these um you know where we where we learn to really rely on on the one who has control over all things we do not we absolutely do not. absolutely well, what is your, your, do you have a final word for us? That might have been a good one right there. <laughs> do you have a, a final word? Because we're nearing the end of our time. Um, I, these topics are so near, dear to my heart. And you've, you've added a lot of wisdom al already, Emerald, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I would say that uh, maybe it's a word uh, for the pandemic, you know, that, um, and maybe it's a, it is a word about faith and, um, and just reaching and looking for, um, for something that will fill that void that we all experience. But also, you know, during times like this pandemic, you know, um, I've had some of the best conversations with people um, that, that I've ever had because, uh, because the pandemic has brought just sort of that sense that we cannot control things and that, you know, truly we are a little bit at the mercy, right? And, and so, but in that, we, we truly are not alone. We have each other. And I think that's very important. I think self-care becomes very critical. And I do think, you know, asking those questions, like, you know, who am I and why am I here? Right. And how will I live my life? You know, how will I live in the pandemic and how will I live for the rest of my days? And, and I think times like this can draw out a certain spirituality that, that you know, leads you uh, to a place kind of it leads you inward yeah. and and I guess my prayer for all of us is that um, is that we would be able to kind of reach up in that process and find um, and find a treasure you know find a treasure in in what can become our relationship with God um, I think seeking I think the journey uh, is as awesome as our destinations and so um you know, I think th during times like this, we can really grow as human beings uh, who, who want to serve others. And, you know, we began by, with service when uh, your very first question was about service. And, uh, and I think, you know, I love, we love making cookies for our neighbor. <laughs> who's, <laughs> who's an older lady and, uh, and we just love her. And, and so that's been sort of our activity in our neighborhood uh, has been cookies and, you know, just simple things. Uh, Mother Teresa, she's my hero. And uh, she said, uh, we, can all, we cannot all do great things. But we can all do small things with great love. There you and go. some years ago, I went back to small things. Yeah. And no, it really uh, is lovely. That's a profound way of challenge and a, a good way to wrap up this conversation. So, mm. Amarillo, this is Dr. Amarillo Sanchez with me. And uh, please look at the show notes for the references and uh, consider her book or her various programs. And uh, it, it was fun and an honor to get to know you better. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm so excited with what you're doing. And I can't wait to hear how it continues okay. to evolve. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye.